Welcome to the Glencliff United Methodist Church Sermon Podcast, where we come together as a community to explore and deepen our faith. I'm delighted to have you join us today from Nashville, Tennessee, a city known for its rich musical heritage and vibrant spirit. Whether you're a longtime member of our congregation, a visitor seeking spiritual nourishment, or someone who stumbled upon this podcast by chance, we extend a warm welcome to you. Here at Glencliff United Methodist Church, we strive to create a space that is inclusive, compassionate, justice-seeking, and rooted in the love of Christ. We believe that faith is a journey, and we're honored to walk alongside each other, offering support and encouragement along the way. Our sermons are crafted with the intention of inspiring, challenging, and illuminating the timeless wisdom found in sacred texts. In this ever-changing world, we find solace and strength in gathering as a community, even in virtual spaces. As we embark on this sacred time together, let us open our hearts and minds, ready to receive the transformative power of God's wisdom. Our sermon from June 18th, 2023 was delivered by a special guest, Kate Fields of Belmont United Methodist Church. She spoke about the two parts of compassion, the initial hurting and the commission to go and share compassion. Listen for Jesus' example of experiencing pain and for examples of compassion in action, which are in line with Jesus' teachings. Now, let us enter into a time of reflection and worship as we delve into today's sermon. So this morning, We are in one of my favorite scriptures, as it turns out, the lectionary has lent itself to this. Um, It's one of those texts that I had glossed over for many years and then heard a sermon once on it and it was like, bam, this this hit, it hit deep. Um, This bit about Jesus having compassion for the people, it stopped me in my tracks. So as I'm preaching and sharing a word this morning, I would love to invite you to think about a time when you needed compassion. Um, Because something maybe that you did uh, that you were in the wrong for, or maybe um, you were just tearing yourself up about something, whether or not you were in the wrong or not. Or maybe one of your identities didn't fit the cultural norms of who gets to be in power, and you felt lonely and hurting and you didn't belong and in that moment someone's compassion was a gift of air and a gift of safety so think about that in your own life today when someone showed you compassion so with that lens let's dive into the gospel text today and explore Jesus's compassion we have this description of how Jesus showed up for the crowd through healing and sharing good news in our scripture of Matthew 9 and 10 today. And actually, what's so fascinating to me is that the text that we have today is so reminiscent of just a few chapters before in Matthew 4. And if you're cool with that, I want to read Matthew 4. uh, And just try to listen for some of those similarities in our text today. Matthew 4 reads this, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues. He announced the good news of the kingdom and healed every disease, there's the healing, and sickness among the people. News spread about him throughout Syria. People brought to him all those who had various kinds of diseases, those in pain, those possessed by demons, those with epilepsy, those who were paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Judea, Jerusalem, and from the areas beyond the Jordan River. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. He sat down and his disciples came to him and he taught them saying, do y'all know what this text is? We are leading into Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, which is what we know as the Beatitudes. A.J. Levine, a New Testament, a great New Testament scholar, calls them Jesus' greatest hits, the Beatitudes. <laughs> and I think it's a great way to explore those, but this is Matthew 4. What I just read is directly leading into the Beatitudes, right? So don't, don't lose that piece, that the impetus or the reason that Jesus... Uh, went into this most famous sermon, his greatest hits, 
was because of the crowd's suffering, yes. right? And so if you remember, the Beatitudes are this, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are peacemakers, blessed are those who show mercy, blessed are those who thirst for justice, blessed are those who are pure in heart, they are the ones who get to see God. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, or in Luke's version of the sermon on, on the plain, they're not on a mountain in Luke, it just says, blessed are the poor. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So blessed basically are those who don't have the power and leverage of money. These are, jo- are Jesus' core teachings, and the impetus of Jesus' core teachings was the crowd who was suffering. And that's what I can't get over. That's why I keep coming back to Christianity and the gospel, because of that kind of love. And I want to talk just a moment, a little bit more about the Beatitudes, because I think it helps set up Jesus' compassion in Matthew 9. Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber is a Lutheran pastor and kind of become a popular author. She wrote, um, or she preached rather on the Sermon on the Mount in the United Kingdom, even though she's from Denver, Colorado. And she decided to try to modernize the language of the Sermon on the Mount, of the Beatitudes. And she does that in a great way. And I'll share an abbreviated version of that, believe it or not, um, because it's a little bit extensive. Um, And so listen to this. Listen to this as if uh, Jesus was here in 2023. How would the Sermon on the Mount sound in 2023? She says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are those who doubt, those who aren't sure, who can still be surprised. Blessed are they who are spiritually impoverished. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are those for whom nothing seems to be working. Blessed are the preschoolers who cut in line at communion. (laughs) Blessed are the poor in spirit. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are are they who have buried their loved ones, for whom tears are as real as an ocean. Blessed are they who have loved enough to know what loss feels like, Blessed are the motherless, the alone, the ones from whom so much has been taken. Blessed are those who are still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who laughed again when for so long they thought they never would. Blessed are those who mourn. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those uh, who no one else notices. Blessed are the kids who sit alone at the middle school lunch tables the laundry guys at the hospital, the parts of ourselves that don't want to make eye contact with a world that only loves winners. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out new ways to hide cuts on their arms. Blessed are the meek. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are they who know there has to be more than this. Blessed are they because they are right. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burnout social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. Blessed are y'all. Y'all are the kingdom of heaven. It's you. That is the kind of love that Jesus has. And so with that in mind, let's take that and come back to our text today in Matthew 9. In this this chapter in Matthew 9, we see the same thing, that Jesus has been traveling to many cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom or kingdom, and curing every disease and sickness. 
Matthew tells us that Jesus had compassion on the crowd because they were afflicted. This Jewish crowd was harassed and helpless or literally thrown down, is, is the Greek there, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. But what does it mean that this crowd was like a sheep without a shepherd? Because I don't know, I don't really get called, uh, I'm not really referred to as a sheep too often uh, these days. But in the Hebrew Bible, or rather the Old Testament, the image of a sheep without a shepherd is used a lot. And it describes the need of people. One example is in Ezekiel 34, 5. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and scattered they became the food for wild animals. And then later in Matthew, Jesus is described, um, the Messiah is described as um, a figure who is to shepherd God's people or Israel. So this is a metaphor that would have been familiar in antiquity in the first century. And so as their shepherd, Jesus enters the suffering of the crowd, the physical, emotional, and demonic malaise. But I want to talk mostly today about how he enters the suffering of the crowd. Who knows how big this crowd was? We don't know much about them. But Jesus was with them. And we hear from Matthew that Jesus had compassion on the crowd because the crowd had not yet known the good news that Jesus was their shepherd. And you remember this, the com- sort of compassion Jesus had on the crowd just a few chapters earlier is what led to all of those blessed statements. And this time when Jesus has compassion on the crowd, the Greek word that we get to see for compassion is actually... It's not a strong enough word in English. Our English word is compassion, but in the Greek, what we have that describes Jesus here is a visceral aching. Jesus hurt for the crowd. It was not an emotional, mental feeling. The word actually means his like viscera, his bowels ached for the crowd. That is the strong, the the strength of this word. That is how deep his love was for these folks. And he wasn't just healing physical ailments. I think that he was hitting that deep core need that we have as humans to be seen and to belong, right? It was more than just physical healing. He was saying, y'all are my sheep. Y'all are my sheep. You belong to me. You aren't lost anymore. You don't have to be lonely anymore. Because we know that loneliness is bad for us, right? Like, it leads us to be hypervigilant. We don't feel safe in being our authentic selves. And I think Jesus is saying, y'all belong. I see you. You're not lonely anymore. You don't have to sit on the edge. And that in itself is healing. The way that Jesus hurt for folks was just how he was. He entered into their suffering with and on behalf of the people. And there's this interesting theological term for this notion. It's called kenosis, and it means self-emptying. Jesus emptied himself to take on full humanity so that he could hurt with us. He could co-suffer with us. That's having a kind of love that hurts, and that's what's so compelling to me to the go- about the gospel. That's why I'm in this. But the, the, the word compassion, that term that we see, there's two parts to it, and that's what I want to kind of... Um, explore in the sermon today there's this there's this hurting part this visceral aching at the beginning but the the way the the kind of compassion that Jesus has it became a commission right and and we see this later in the text when he essentially commissions the disciples to go um, and go he said y'all see what I'm doing go do this too 
And that is the commissioning of the gospel. That is when he said the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So y'all go do this. Have that kind of love. I don't want you to have like this superficial nicety kind of love. I want you to love people so much that it hurts. Y'all go do this. And I wonder if we can't take that lesson too. What does this mean for us? That compassion, what what does compassion, this sort of compassion, this sort of love look like for each of us in 2023 in our lives? Sometimes having compassion in the sense of aching for someone means that we're just able to sit vulnerably with them in the hardest times and just be present with them. But sometimes compassion, if it's because of an unjust system that functions to keep some folks on the bottom, that, that commission looks very different. So the situation kind of uh, dictates the compassion and the commission. But in Matthew 25, we know that compassion and commission look like extending a cup of cold water to someone in need or visiting someone in prison, feeding the hungry or clothing the naked. These actions require uh, you to first know your neighbor's circumstance and then be present with it, right? And respond with compassion. But today, a cup of cold water might look like leaving gallons of water for migrants coming through the Sonoran Desert, um, trying to get to a better life. We're, Maybe visiting today in prison means getting to know uh, someone on death row at Riverbend. Or maybe feeding the hungry today looks like getting involved in our local food system and helping folks have access to fresh, culturally appropriate foods. Or maybe eating locally so that we can reduce our carbon footprint and, you know, eat tomatoes from here instead of um, across the country. Maybe clothing the naked involves wearing second-hand clothing uh, so that we can have more clothes to go around. Maybe it's accompanying a trans friend to a bathroom uh, so that they feel safe. Maybe it's learning the ways um, that your skin color could privilege you in showing up for racial justice. And maybe it's joining the movement for common sense gun legislation to keep our children safe. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw that you were hungry and gave you food? And when was it that we saw you were thirsty and gave you a drink? And when was it that we saw that you were a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? When was it that we saw that you were sick and, and visited you in prison? When was it that we saw you in these things? Truly, I tell you, just as you did this to one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Compassion and commission. Jesus hurt for them. He entered their suffering. And it changed him and it changed them. And then he said, y'all go do this too. This is how I want you to represent me in the world. People should know that you follow me by your love, by that kind of love. That is good news. That is good news. I want to end today by reading an excerpt of a poem that um, this text, the scripture text, reminds me of. I thought about it immediately as soon as I read the lectionary text for today. I think we have a patron saint of poetry, and I think her name is Mary Oliver. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to read an excerpt of one of her poems. Um, her poem's called, What Have I Learned So Far? Can one be passionate about the just, the ideal, the sublime, and the holy, and yet commit to no labor in its cause? I don't think so. All summations have a beginning. All effect has a story. All kindness begins with a sown seed. Thought buds toward radiance. The gospel of light is the crossroads of indolence or action. Be ignited or be gone. 
be ignited or be gone. Glencliff, be ignited or be gone. May it ever be so. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this thought-provoking and hopefully uplifting sermon from Glencliff United Methodist Church. We hope that the message has resonated with you, inspiring you to live out your faith in meaningful ways. Remember, our journey of faith doesn't end here. As we go forth from this moment, let us carry the light of God's love within us, shining brightly in our relationships, our communities, and the world around us. May we be agents of healing, justice, and reconciliation guided by the teachings of Jesus. We invite you to connect with us further and explore the many opportunities for growth, fellowship, and service that our church offers. If you found today's sermon meaningful, share it with a friend or loved one who may benefit from these words of encouragement. If you'd like to support Glencliff United Methodist Church financially, visit glencliffumc.org slash donate. Until we meet again, remember that you are cherished and your presence in this world matters. God loves you. There's nothing you can do about that. You can simply choose how you'll respond to that love. Amen.